On this week in Enterprise Tech, we talk about FCC's competitive logic, white box networking, and Curtis, Brian, and I talk with a great guest, Nathan Pierce from F5 Networks, about DevOps. Quiet on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 306, recorded August 31st, 2018, F5 Super Net Ops. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by LastPass. Secure every password protected entry point to your business. Join over 33,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. And by... Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Wasabi's disruptive cloud storage technology is helping enterprises solve one of their fastest growing issues, data storage. See for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click free trial and use the offer code enterprise. And buy DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash enterprise. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host for today, Louis Moreski, your guide through this big world in the enterprise, but I, I definitely don't want to guide you by myself. I need a little help from the professionals, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, Senior Editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, thanks so much for being here. You're uh, you're in your new place now, right? Thank you, Louis. Yes, I am. This is... Um the the permanent home of the Swamp Studio now, and it feels very good to be here. Fantastic! Now you're you're doing a little traveling coming up soon too, right? Uh, got a little bit, but uh, it's nice that most of the industry events are coming to me. That's a, a great thing about living in one of the cities where there are a lot of events. So. A uh, number of company events uh, from companies like Splunk and uh, your own Microsoft, as well as things like Gartner Symposium later on. So I will be out and about, but uh, fortunately, I get to sleep in my own bed for most of it. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm still I'm still trying to figure out if I'm going to go to Ignite yet or not. So we'll have to see uh, where we're talking about content. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but uh, hopefully I'll get down there and uh, we'll be able to, to, to sync up. Cool. Well, of course, I can't do this show without another professional in the market. That's starting with Mr. Brian McHenry from F5 Networks. Brian, it's always great to have you back and uh, and seeing your bright face. <laughs> hey, thanks, Lou. I'm starting to settle in, figuring out how to do this co-host thing. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. You know, you have a you have a new title at F5 too, right? Yes, I do. I am now, uh, instead of the global customer solutions lead, we've uh, reorganized a little bit and we're putting a re-emphasis on security, which as anyone who's listened to this show knows, security is really where my heart and soul uh, is when it comes to enterprise technology. So uh, I'll be heading up our security architects team going forward and working with the security business unit to help shape products that hopefully F5 customers really want to use. Fantastic. Well, we have some great uh, topics today about security, so hopefully we'll tug those security professional strings that you got there. But, you know, we also have some other great topics. We're talking a little bit about FCC uh, rationalizing competitive markets, um, also about a little bit about white box networking. And, of course, we have a great guest to talk about super net ops and how it's bringing DevOps to organizations. But first, like we always do, let's go ahead and jump into those blips. Now, it wouldn't be a week in tech news without data breaches. Now, for some reason, this story actually seemed to kind of slip through the cracks in the last coming weeks. But this time we have our favorite ISP Comcast Xfinity to thank for the data leak. Now, how many customers were impacted? Uh, not that many, just 26.5 million. And what about the data leak? Uh, was normal? Like what kind of data did I actually get leaked? Well, customer contact information, partial home addresses. Oh, and and your social security numbers too. That's right, your social security number is now floating around with even more hackers this time. Can you hear the uh, drum roll in the background where they start offering you monitoring services 
from Comcast, but this specific flaw was actually uncovered by security researcher Ryan Stevenson. Now, let's talk about where the vulnerabilities originated from. The first issue started at Comcast's online customer portal. Now, if anyone used it, I, I, I personally think that that portal is kind of a mess of a piece of security as well as uh, software. But, you know, what you'll notice is one of the flaws when you go to that in-home authentication page, the user is able to pay their bills without signing in. That's because it actually verifies your account information based on your partial home address uh, suggested by the Comcast site and as well as uh, if you're on your home network. Now, you can appear to be on your home network and that can be spoofed. So that's kind of where that vulnerability comes from. Now, the second vulnerability was discovered by the sign up page from Comcast authorized dealers. And by using a customer's billing address, a hacker could brute force the last four digits of a customer's social security number because eventually the page doesn't actually limit the amount of temp attempts. So hackers could reveal the social security number eventually. So magic. There you go. Now, if you are a Comcast Xfinity customer, you better go secure your account and information. And this includes getting yourself some identity monitoring services because this time it's almost a guarantee that someone across the world will become you. Well, now, as someone who works for an international company, I can't tell you how frustrating it can be to be, well, as monolingual as I am. And it can also be frustrating for those who have a working knowledge of a language and get thrown off by the accents or dialects. Uh, this is one of those things I found true when I was doing work in Scotland or as a Southerner who was living and working in New England. Now, Amazon is helping out by leveraging their work in natural languages to detect an incoming accent for both parties and to translate not only the language, but also the accents between the conversing parties. I think this is a great idea for business and consumers. I just wonder how long it's going to be before Amazon Echo is going to start slipping some street cred in my direction when I ask it something. Well, not to be left out of the data breach games, a major financial service firm uh, finds a flaw in uh, their application that exposed customer data for hundreds of banks. Fiserv might be the biggest financial institution you've never heard of. They provide online banking, account management, and transaction processing for hundreds of banks. The customers of their retail banking platform are typically smaller community or regional banks and credit unions who might not otherwise be able to provide robust and secure services to their end user consumers. Brian Krebs reported on the issue August 28th and Fiserv has responded swiftly. Fiserv says they developed a security patch within 24 hours of receiving the notification and deployed the patch to both their hosted and on-premises customers shortly thereafter. The flaw in question is what OWASP would classify as forceful browsing. Security researcher Christian Eric Hermanson brought the flaw to Krebs' attention. Hermanson noticed that once authenticated to his bank account, he was able to increment a number in a URL string, suspecting that it might be sequential. Lo and behold, he was correct and was able to gain access to transactions, statements, and even the ability to change certain contact information in other customers' accounts. This type of flaw is not a so-called zero day or a cutting edge exploit and speaks to the point, uh, the need rather for better session management and authentication measures in web applications. An interesting point in this case is that Fiserv pinpointed the flaw to an underlying messaging system in their platform. Now, democratizing the energy markets means that the cost of energy as well as usage of energy could be controlled by the consumer. But what if we got closer to that by moving away from the high cost of commercial solar technology and moved into a place where consumers controlled the market? Imagine that you can print your own solar cells, bind them together with your choice of interconnects, transformers, and batteries to have your own power plant. Well, University of Newcastle professor Paul DeStore is looking at living the dream with this example of using a set of organic print, organic, organically printed solar cells to power his LCD screens and displays. Now, less than a millimeter thick, that actually held down by inexpensive double-sided tape, the panels can be produced for less than $10 per square meter, which is roughly around about $10 per 10.5 square feet. Now, at this point, the technology still needs to some work, 
but it has some promise. And of course, at this point, the silicone based technology is more efficient and it doesn't degrade as fast as the organic one. But there is hope with uh, what the major focus is on is actually even if there is issues with the organic version is the actual energy cost. The materials are so cheap to make and manufacture and install that when you calculate the total cost of energy when manufacturing at scale, it, it's going to give the organic version a competitive edge. Now, with the cost so low, the industry is starting to notice, and in a few years, you too might have printed your way to energy freedom. Well, the story of retail for the past few years has been one of Amazon disrupting market after market, and it looks like the next market they could hit is networking gear. Amazon's networking devices will consist of open source software and unbranded hardware known as white box switches and come with built-in connections to AWS cloud services like the servers and storage. Now, we've been tinkering with the concept of white box top of rack solutions and are finding that we can potentially get some serious cost savings in exchange for having OT support for the Switch OS versions of Linux. There are commercial solutions like Cumulus and open source versions like OpenSwitch that both seem to provide the switch side of the SDN world. But if you're willing to trade sweat equity for budget dollars, you could probably save upward of 75% on top of rack solutions. Just be prepared to invest heavily in the learning curve for the Linux Switch OS. Oculus is bringing its Rift and Go VR headsets to classrooms around the world. Now, as an Oculus owner myself, I find this pretty exciting. Facebook-owned Oculus is distributing a number of its tethered Rift and Oc mobile Go headsets to schools, museums, and libraries glo globally, beginning in Seattle, Taiwan, and Japan. As part of the Oculus education program, the headsets will be used to train educators how to use virtual reality to enhance education and gain feedback on the role of VR in the classroom. To support greater adoption of VR as an educational tool, Oculus re released three new experiences in the Oculus Store this week. The first focuses on the contributions of women scientists such as Jane Goodall, and the second is entitled Titanic VR, and as you might guess, provides detailed tours and even a recreation of the 1912 sinking of the ill-fated British passengers liner. The last title is Hoover Dam industrial VR, with tours and descriptions of the inner workings of one of the seven wonders of the modern world. All the titles are available for free in the Oculus Store today. Even though VR technology in the consumer space has been slow to be adopted, prices are going to come down for VR rigs and tethering requirements will disappear. Even Microsoft pointed to uh, wireless VR rigs as a reason why they didn't in institute VR on the latest Xbox. Now, the intuitive immersive aspects of VR make it perfect for education and training applications, and I would ex even expect VR to eventually find a place in the enterprise for training and simulator purposes. If you've been dismissing e VR as a niche gaming platform, head over to the Oculus Store and check out some of these free educational software. It's a learning experience like no other. Now, we all remember that scene in the Red Planet movie back in 2000 when Val Kilmer actually pulled out of his pocket that transparent scroll computer. Well, manufacturers have been waiting for a chance to build one of those things ever since, but we're limited to the available technology. Now, it seems like that is no longer an issue. Researchers at Queens and University Human Media Lab have built a prototype that's a touchscreen device that's neither a smartphone nor a tablet but a scroll. Now, coined the magic scroll, its rolled-up form has a cylindrical form factor enabled by a flexible 7.5-inch touchscreen housed in the cylinder casing. Currently, the flexible screen on the prototype has a resolution of 2K, but with Samsung's 4K flexible OLEDs, this could change in the near future. Now, although they're saying their inspiration was that old Rolodex filing system that were used to store and browse contacts cards, I can't help but think that Red Planet had some play in it. Now, as they move forward in R&D, they are targeting a more pen-like form factor, um, and that will actually reduce the size and weight and increase the portability of the device, making it more consumer-friendly. Now, if nothing else, this could be the forcing function to help transform the market into using a new form factor for mobile devices. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites, and we have some pretty good ones. But first, we got to thank a really great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's LastPass. Now, 
I use LastPass so often that I don't even know I'm using it anymore. I just go to sites, it immediately jumps in and logs me in, and I don't have to worry about remembering the username and passwords that I have differently for every site that I have, especially all my bank sites. Um, and in fact, I have five different bank sites that I actually go to. So remembering those different username and password for each one of them is almost impossible. Now, you don't want to write those passwords down on sticky notes or maybe even email them to yourself because because that's a security risk that can open the door to securities. And that's where LastPass comes in and saves us all. Now, they automatically remember and fill in your passwords anytime, anywhere on your computer or your mobile device. All you have to do is remember your master password and LastPass remembers the rest. Now, I got hooked on using LastPass when I used it on my desktop, but it's really useful on all of my devices. Um, any browser, most of the browsers out there have support for it. Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Opera, and more. Plus, it works really great with your Android and your iOS device. Now, I remember that day that I was at work and I got a call from my family and they said, hey, we, we need to make a payment, but we don't know the password. We don't remember it. Did I remember it? Of course, I didn't remember it. I have different passwords for every site. So all I had to do is jump online, visit that last pass vault, use that one and only master password, and then bam, I could easily give them that password and they could log in and, and, and actually pay those bills. Now, LastPass has literally saved me time and obviously time is money. Now, I'm talking about my personal use account with LastPass, but they also have LastPass families for the entire family as well as LastPass for the enterprise too. Now, enterprises are always battling trying to keep people out from breaching the networks. Now, over 81% of breaches are actually caused by weak or reused passwords. Plus, a survey shows that 32% of employees actually share passwords with others. Now, LastPass makes it easy for you actually generate random passwords for your employees. Plus, password sharing is made even easier through the LastPass services. Now, organizations can set a master password requirement and restrict access to specific devices, locations, and enable password resets and much more. They also offer multi-factor auth. And with the latest LastPass authenticator, it blocks attackers from sharing that identity of the accessor is the one that you know about. Now, get this. This will actually raise some eyebrows for IT admins. Um, they also have Active Directory integration. Now, employees can log in to LastPass with Microsoft Active Directory credentials, so they truly only have one password to remember, their AD password. Now, also last with LastPass Enterprise, you can configure over 100 policies, access security reports, create shared folders. You can even share a ton of other stuff, including organizational database logins, SSH keys, software licenses, and other important business data. Now, data is encrypted at the device level and data is stored in the vault and kept secret even from LastPass. From easy onboarding to password autofill, LastPass makes it easy for businesses to take control of passwords and reduce the threat of breach. Honestly, I use LastPass every day. I'll continue to use LastPass for life. Now, more than 13 million people trust LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit today. That's lastpass.com slash twit and see which product is right for you. And we thank LastPass for their support. And congratulations to LastPass for celebrating their 10th anniversary this past July. Well, let's get back to fights. We have a pretty, a couple good ones today. We're talking a little bit about how the SEC considers monopolies and then we'll maybe jump into white box networking. But Let's talk about the FCC side of things here. Now, now many audiences members actually live in areas where they may only have one internet provider. And this and the price is high, the service is poor, and they have really no leverage to make it any better. Well, the FCC voted last year to eliminate price caps imposed on some business broadband providers such as AT&T and Verizon. And, and now what that means for businesses is that FCC eliminated caps in any given county if 50% of potential customers are, quote, are within a half mile of a location served by competitive providers. That means that business customers with just one choice are often considered to be located in a competitive market and no longer benefit from price controls. Now, this decision affects BDSs or business data services, which is actually dedicated to what they call point-to-point -point broadband links, which are delivered over copper-based CDM networks by phone companies like AT&T, Verizon, and CenturyLink. Now, SEC's decision was challenged in court by the competitive local exchange carriers and purchasers of business broadband, which actually include Sprint and Windstream. But 
the U.S. Court of Appeals actually agrees with the SEC. The interesting thing here is that the court also rejected challenges to the economic theory and merits of the SEC's competitive market test. Now, here's the court quote uh, of their decision. Quote, the SEC made rational choice which evidence to believe among conflicting evidence in its proceedings, especially predicting that will, what will happen in the markets under the jurisdiction. Now, they actually get to choose, the FCC actually gets to choose which evidence they believe. Now, some groups like the CFA believe that because nearly every enterprise, nonprofit, and government institution purchases BDS for essential connectivity, charges are ultimately passed on and borne by consumers and taxpayers. Now, in fact, mobile users will also be affected by this because those higher monthly rates, because most wireless carriers actually purchase their network connectivity from BDS cust BDS uh, providers. So uh, guys, I want to throw this over to you. I mean, the, does this make any sense to you? Maybe, maybe to you, Curtis, first. Does, <laughs> does this rationalization of, of competitive markets and competition make any sense when it applies to a monopoly in an area? Well, I don't think so. But then again, I think what we have here is one of those great examples of the fact that language used in laws and regulation may mean something entirely different than it means in normal conversation. I mean, many attorneys depend on this. And so what we have is, um, you know, something of an Alice in Wonderland thing where the words mean what the regulators say they mean. So what we think about when we talk about the word competitive obviously has been defined to mean something else in terms of regulation. Now, I think that by any rational meaning, uh, if you've only got one incumbent, then it's not competitive. But I also think that what we have is an FCC that has shown itself to be hyper pro incumbent, right. hyper pro carrier, and very much non consumer based. And we're learning that that means non consumer bias, whether the consumer is an individual or a corporation. So I suppose that the, the lesson to be learned here is that if you want preferential treatment from the FCC, you just need to go out and buy your own network. <laughs> right, right. Well, the, the brief they, the FCC actually put out a brief, and it talks about three and even four uh, uh, level firms and areas uh, for the markets. But it never really talks about the competition between one or even just two firms and markets. So why they say a monopoly market is still competitive uh, considered competitive. I don't know. What do you think, Brian? Um, you know, what, what's the FCC thinking here? I, I'm not really sure. I think it, it may be the fact that it, it's still provided you're willing to jump through the hoops of fire and do all the work that it's still possible to get a waiver and get, and, and get another uh, provider pulled all the way to your location, provided that other provider is sufficiently motivated, right? So what they might be saying about th these particular scenarios is that the 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 CLEX, the carrier local exchanges, um, those those smaller uh, businesses m might actually have the facility to cross these you know paper boundaries, but in reality, you know it costs those businesses too much to pull. Uh, service to a, a location that might only be serviced by one ISP at this point in time. So I th I'm trying to come up with a rationale, and I'm really, it really just, it, it just seems utterly corrupt at its core. But, but I think that might be what they're pointing to. But it, it really, you know, you, you called it right out in the core of the, the the court decision is that they're really leaving it up to the FCC to rationalize, you know, what's the reality and what might happen in that market. Uh, in the future, right? So the 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 court's almost saying, hey, the FCC can kind of pr will can predict the future within uh, reasonable parameters about what might happen in a market to create competition. Um, not really, you know. I'm really trying to play the devil's advocate here, so we're not all just uh, sl slamming this decision. Uh, but but it really does seem like the you know the erosion of net neutrality and the erosion of uh, consumer rights when it comes to uh, carrier access 
was already slipping and really had very few protections in my mind uh, is is really it's it's getting worse not better right now in in the SEC's brief they also claimed a little bit of a rationalization themselves and they said that the cost of regulation is likely out to outweigh the extra cost paid by consumers when dominant carriers can what they call exercise market power in the absence of regulation so that they're basically saying that hey you know if we have more a competitive market with one or two it, it's going to cost us more to regulate anything than it is to just kind of let it go in the wind i mean is you know let's let's go back to you curtis is this is this a way to to govern us to regulate this to make sure that there's competitive markets or that the consumers win here or is is there a better way well you you start to get into a, a whole discussion on the philosophy of regulation and uh, what we have again is obviously an FCC that uh, operates from the the philosophical position that regulations should be as limited as possible and so they see this as a way of limiting those regulations. Um, do I think that being a little more proactive might give better results? Well, I do, but that involves my philosophy of regulation. I'm, I'm okay with a little bit heavier hand than the current FCC is, is happy with. Um, you know, I, I think it gets down to, to something that's similar, and, and I'll give an example. Um, here in Florida, we recently had our um, primary elections. And the way it's written, <clears throat> if you have no um, – if, if all you have, for example, is a Democratic primary in a particular race, if there is no Republican, then the Democratic primary is open. That means everybody can vote because that primary will determine the winner of the election. So there are an awful lot of people who go around doing things like entering write-in candidates for particular races to make sure that – there's someone in the other and, and the primaries aren't open. I think what we have here is the FCC doing things like saying as long as, say, Hughes Satellite exists, then there is no place where you aren't going to have some level of competition. Wherever it's possible to find some dark cable, it's going to be possible to have an option for a different network service. So if you define it in the broadest possible way, then you get to the situation we have here. For most organizations, though, except for the very largest customers, what you really need is a good, strong ISP. And that's where the regulation breaks down under the current situation. I, I just, like I said, philosophically, I'm comfortable with a bit more regulation than the current FCC Board of Governors is. Right. So, Brian, you, you have a little bit of a different view of rationalization of this, right? Because you feel that this could actually be altered by the local markets, local exchanges, right? Right. So so there is a, a way to look at this and say that, all right, well, the AT&Ts and Verizons of the world, they think, listen, we built this big backbone infrastructure that connects, you know, huge hundreds, thousands of miles across the United States, across oceans, around the world. Um, so if these these local carriers and local exchanges feel like um, they're being blocked out of certain markets where we've built infrastructure. They're more than welcome uh, to to build that last mile infrastructure and reach these underserved markets where there's less competition. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a little hard pressed, right? This is a little bit chicken and the egg scenario because it, it's this type of infrastructure. Uh, you know, the big providers have had a huge head start in terms of you know having the, the, the carrier network built a long time ago in the days of, you know, telephones and been able to build across and, and you know, the original cable TV, they've had, had these existing infrastructures that they've been able to build on and reinvest in. And these, these local exchanges, you know, are, are looking at net new infrastructure, huge investments. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a bit of a, uh, you know, an inherited position by the larger providers that, the the smaller providers would really struggle to build net new infrastructure. So so you know I'm trying to see again once again both sides of, of the argument here. Um, I think the game changer that that Curtis alluded to is you know 5G um, 
technology, right? That's that's wireless technology with the uh, latency of a of a landline. And it, if the, if those types of technologies take off, then you know you might be able to really argue that the the infrastructure costs are more minimal, and that the the markets actually could have more competition without all the uh, you know big investment to reach those underserved areas. Right, right, right. Well, before we get too far into a philosophical discussion, I think we should probably move on. So, well, we do have a very another interesting topic here, and this is this is around the commoditization of traditional Ethernet networking, and that's with white box networking and the the institution or the the involvement of SDNs with that. Now, you know, we have seen this in the past. We've seen uh, where technology markets have shifted slightly when we went to this kind of white box. Now, commercial networking with, you know, routers and so on, they've gone to open source OSs and we've seen some change where now different different companies are standardizing the hardware that's on their, con, you know, consumer devices so that they can actually put these OSs on there and, and consumers get the advantage. But we've not seen this in the commercial side. So this is where the commercial side is starting to adopt uh, the white box technique where, you know, now the hardware can be kind of put together, whether, whether it's the application-specific integrated circuit uh, where they uh, use things like Broadcom, Intel, or Marvel, um, or or if it's actually some of the uh, internal parts of the device as well as the OS. So, you know, this is an interesting thing because it does show that um, by going this way, it can make it possibly cheaper uh, for organizations. But that's kind of potentially the misnomer because there actually has been a study done by, um, I think it was Forrester, that tries to get around the myths of uh, whether white box is actually beneficial or not. And the reason why they're saying it's not at this point that much more beneficial is because now that uh, vendors are starting to see the advantage of using uh, off-the-shelf components, that they're starting to move to those off-the-shelf off components as well. And they're doing it at volume, which is actually reducing the costs. Now, I want to go throw this over to you guys. Now, we, we've seen that, you know, companies like Facebook and Google and a lot of large organizations, even, um, you know, I think Dropbox out there, they're, they're building their kind of top of rack switches, switches um, using their own um, off the shelf components so they can kind of regulate what they put in there and, and, and then so on and so forth. Is this something that maybe businesses should start considering to, or to, to help reduce costs? Or do you think that it's a misnomer that they won't actually reduce costs? What do you think, Curtis? Well, I think it depends on exactly what your needs are. If you're in a business and you need 10 switches, by all means, go out and buy a good switch with all the support that it, that it comes with. If you need to buy 10,000 switches, then, then this makes a lot of sense because you can customize what you need. You're going to have the staff to do it and you can make sure that you have the lowest cost and the most complete personalization of the switches. So in the same way that, um, that white box servers to a great extent are an issue of scale, white box switches are exactly the same way. Right. What do you think, Brian? Is this is this is this actually a cost savings or just going to increase costs? Well, I think it does. It saves the upfront the the capital cost, and it'll save you some ongoing maintenance costs, and 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 quite substantially so. But where the additional other additional cost comes in is an expertise, right? It's the same with open source software too, right? So if we talk about the difference between running Linux and Apache versus Windows Server and IIS, well, why would I pay Microsoft all this money for licensing when there's a perfectly good and perfectly widely used alternative um, sitting right there from you know open source foundations? And the reason being, um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago that you might choose Windows is because there's a plethora first of Windows trained and certified engineers who are available. Uh, I have a lot of support from Microsoft themselves that I can turn to through that maintenance agreement that I'm paying for. And I know that I can fix it if anything breaks. And really that's that's a lot of what information technology and, and working in the enterprise is, is about is can I fix things when they break? Can I fix them very rapidly? Um, can I forestall it or or uh, avoid those outages by having good support. Now, if I go to the open source model, a white box switch or what have you, um, if there's if it's hard to find the talent to support that open source solution, uh, that's a problem. That means the talent that is available is going to be very expensive. Now, 
Fast forward to where we are today with Apache and Linux, and it's so widespread. And those those skills, um, my son knows quite a bit about monitoring, monitoring uh, HTTP HTTPD and, and looking at .conf files. And it's a really widespread and common uh, skill set. And you can really tap into a lot of talent base and not have to overpay for it. So that's a that's a big component that I'm looking at. Is there is a there's a a, a place where I've got to pay. You got to support it somehow. It's not going to be free. Um, and I think the other thing to look at is if you look at the Dropbox of the world, the Netflixes, the places where they've gone to more white box, either server or network or other solutions, they've gone to white box because they derive their revenue sh directly through those systems. Um, some enterprises are still using the network largely to facilitate their business. It is not the network is not driving the business itself. Uh, quite directly, as in the case of of a company like Dropbox or Google or or what have you, right? Makes sense. I think you know, a couple things in the chat room are saying. Specs is saying, "Hey, there's no zero touch turnkey 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 solution yet." And also, Emily Strange points out, "Hey, you know, there's a lot of money in the fact that uh, HP Dell and Cisco actually they have really fast hardware support." And I guess this kind of brings that up: is you know, manufacturers starting to see, "Hey, white box." is interesting because you know, a lot of companies and organizations are adopting it because um, they're trying to reduce costs. Um, and the fact that they're using open source OS is like Humulus Linux um, and they're using the, the off-the-shelf components like the Broadcom Trident uh, uh, ASIC processors. And so you know they're starting to see this and starting to adopt it. So we're seeing that the Cisco Nexus 3100, the Dell S6000, uh, the HP Flex, they're all kind of adopting these off-the-shelf components and the open source OSs. So you almost get the best of both worlds here because they can do the set volume. They can offer the, the hardware at a cheaper price. But then you kind of get the 24-hour support that they offer. You can pay a little extra for that. They get the expertise from them if you need a configuration and support. So, um, you know, Curtis, I want to throw this to you. Is, is this just going to hurt the white box market um, when, when, the, you know, when the actual masses start to figure out, hey, we can do this too. We can do this at scale. And we can also offer the peace of mind and support that these customers need as well. Well, again, I, I think it depends on the scale of the business you're talking about. Um, the The small companies um, are generally going to go with with the commercial offerings, re regardless of of whether it's you know a commercial offering that's using off the shelf hardware or one that has you know is based on ASICs and FPGAs, um, because they want the the support the service the reliability that's going to come with the the well-known name on the front of the box the the really big organizations the the big networks uh vendors the the huge multinational corporations will probably start looking even more heavily at white boxes and and custom programs because again the cost savings are there the customization is there. The place where the market is going to be really interesting are those organizations that are going to be purchasing somewhere between a thousand and five thousand switches, because there they're going to have some really interesting calculus to do to see where their interests lie, where where their support costs lie what their development staff looks like. And I think it's a real toss up there. And, and that is an awful lot of companies. It's a huge market and it's going to be enormously competitive over the next oh, three to five years. Thanks Curtis. Yeah. I think that that's the key, the key term there is competitive market. I think it definitely helps organizations, consumers alike. So hopefully that'll kind of continue to move forward and uh, we'll see the advantage. Well, folks, that does it for the Bites. Next up, our guest, my favorite part of the show. We get to bring a guest in to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot. But first, we want to thank another sponsor of This Week at Enterprise Tech, and that's Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. Now, you might be saying, hey, hot cl cloud storage is expensive. The more you store in it, the more times you access it and perform operations on it. And in, in this day and age, it's, it's actually true. A lot of services out there, a lot of the competitions feel like, hey, we'll just lower our storage fees and lower our ingress and egress fees and we'll try to become competitive in the market but you're still kind of paying for all that stuff now from experience i can tell you that you know the more things you actually try to if even if you go to the bottom tier cloud services that are out there today you're still paying those fees and 
sometimes you kind of remove, reduce the performance and the reliability of storage as well. Well, these these things and more is what Wasabi cloud, cloud hot cloud storage is actually targeting here. Now, if you're a small business just doing small projects or even a large enterprise, Wasabi seems to have figured it all out. Now, listen to this. The cost is $4.99 per terabyte per month. And plus, listen to this one. The unlimited free egress and no charge for API calls so you don't have to pay to actually access your data. Now, you should go check out right now what you're already paying on your cloud storage because I can tell you that not only not having to include egress fees and API calls for those CRUD operations will substantially save you money and the cost of doing business. Now, you're probably thinking, well, if they're cheaper, they must be slower, must must be less reliable, um, or they maybe don't have all the features. Well, Wasabi has really developed some disruptive technology, and they have ways to pull raw performance out of their storage devices without compromising anything else. They have a revolutionary process that lays down data on disks sequentially as opposed to blocks. And what happens? Well, that, that means that Wasabi's storage is 80% cheaper and six times faster in speed than some of the industry leaders. Now, if your organization is worried about compliance, well, Wasabi has HIPAA, FINRA, and CJS compliance as well. And not only that, but they also have fast, cheap storage. You know, m doesn't really mean anything if you're not secure. Well, Wasabi has the answer to that as well. Wasabi offers unique features such as immutable buckets that cannot be deleted or altered, thus protecting valuable data from accidental malicious destruction, which is not available in some of the competition solutions, and 11 nines of durability. Now, are you worried about your migration of your data from, to, from different cloud services? Well, Wasabi has also an answer to this as well. They have what they call Wasabi Ball Transfer Appliance, and this thing is actually powered by Netgear, and it's designed to transfer large data sets while actually dramatically reducing costs and improving speed. Now, if you're already looking for cloud storage out there already, then your organization probably has tried to store data maybe maybe on-premise on and said, hey, our costs are too high, so maybe let's try to move to a co-location co center, or maybe we'll move to cloud storage. Well, if you're thinking about not moving to cloud storage, I think with Wasabi, they'll make you think again. Experience Wasabi for yourself with free Unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click the free trial link, and enter the code ENTERPRISE. See how much storing in the cloud can save your business? That's wasabi.com, and enter the code ENTERPRISE. We thank Wasabi for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, now it's time for my favorite part of the show, where we get to bring a guest and drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And today is no exception. We have Nathan Pierce, Solution Architect from the Office of the CTO from F5 Networks. Nathan, welcome to the show. I like the show, and I'm glad I could be a part of it today. Absolutely. So we have a really great topic uh, to talk about today. That's DevOps. But first, let, what, the audience loves hearing about our guests, a little bit about their kind of a journey through technology. Can you tell us, to folks at home, kind of you know where you started and how you got to where you're at today? So I, uh, I, I bounced around for a number of years in uh, various places, startups, et cetera, and then uh, got hooked on F5. And 12 and a half years later, I'm still here. <laughs> These days, uh, I'm in the office of the CTO where we're uh, charged with looking further into the future than maybe a normal product team would to see what's coming. Trends both technically and operationally, trends on how people consume and deploy and use technology as well. So um, I'm closer to the developer advocate side, but our roles do very much transform based on what those trends are that are happening. Uh, to, to give a couple of examples, lately I've been doing a bit of work with um, GitHub around configuration as code, while also um, writing some open source uh, telemetry pipeline solutions, how to get lots of rich data out the network into things like Grafana dashboards. Basically cool, fun stuff. Right, right. Well, I mean, DevOps today is, is actually a kind of the talk of the town. Organizations are trying to reduce their costs by reducing the impedance between customers receiving a product, supporting them, uh, servicing them, and fixing and kind of rolling out improvements. Now, can you kind of walk us through, um, you know, some of the advantages of DevOps and, um, you know, how if how and if organizations are adopting it? So, I mean, I, I guess first to, to just set the scene that we're all on the same page. When, whenever people talk about transformation, um, 
the technology transformation was the desire, how quick I could get resources out to their intended consumers. But really operational transformation is what was needed to make that a reality. And if I'm not transforming people and the way they interact with and look at technology, then there's no way I can really ch achieve the digital transformations that we're setting ahead of us. So, and and this isn't a brand new thing. Like it was in 2009 when John Allspore and Paul Hammond got up at the a Velocity uh, conference in, in the Bay Area and said, we're going to do 10 plus deployments a day. And like people thought they were crazy and then they explained how. And it was like, it's actually the way they, they looked at the technology and interacted with the technology that really changed. So that, that's kind of cool what's happening. And you can see why now that organizations, we, we, we have to be more competitive. We can't wait a year or, or six months for a new deployment to then see what the reaction was to that and then work out how we're going to do the next deployment. We need to be testing things all the time and interacting all the time um, with customers, getting that feedback and, and working out how we can continuously involve. And uh, anytime someone asks me to talk about continuous, you should probably count the amount of times I use the word, sorry, about DevOps, how many times I use the word continuous because I get a little bit obsessive about that term. <laughs> right. I mean, if you if you don't have kind of that continuous service deployment, a continuous operations capabilities, continuous kind of quality of service going forward, it doesn't make sense to move to uh, something like DevOps, especially since it's, it potentially could be a culture shift. Now, you know, you guys are kind of talking about something new. This what the concept of called Super Net Ops Initiative. Can you kind of walk us through that and and describe kind of how it's different from DevOps in, in general? Sure. So when when we started looking at this operational transformation that had to occur. Um, we, we, we came at it from uh, multiple different angles. Uh, developers were getting more uh, influence around infrastructure purchasing decisions just because they they had to create these continuous delivery pipelines. So we looked at, you know, what would it take to get maybe a software engineer to become an expert in networking? Can we make them interact more with application delivery technology? Or can we take the people at the other end, the networking engineers that have all that domain knowledge and bring them closer to DevOps? And it, it there was no question about which way was uh, which was going to be the faster route to market because that domain knowledge that people have accumulated from working for years in the network industry that's significant. We can't just give someone a few manuals to read over the weekend and suddenly they can replace NetOps. I mean, the networking operations team they they've learn some gnarly routing protocols that are, are why they're so valuable. So it made far more sense to teach the principles and practices of software engineering, not make them full on uh, coders, but, but to teach the principles and practices that make DevOps possible to people who have spent their whole career on a CLI. So that, that was our approach. It wasn't, we're not, we're not an alternative to DevOps. We're about the transition from, from a couple of decades of, of an operating practice and making that more um, compatible with DevOps and the continuous methodologies. Right. So I think that, you know, what we see a lot of times when we, when we get to organizations that are trying to adopt DevOps, we see kind of a resistance almost between kind of the operations and the, you know, the development organizations uh, because they don't necessarily communicate the best with each other. Um, and they both all have different processes and they all have different systems that they use um, and, and different ways of handling things. Do you see sometimes that that's also a reason why an organization might be slow to adopt DevOps? That that is a, a, a key area. There is definitely some reluctance at, at our um, our company conference every year, where all our customers kind of fly in. Um, three years ago, we we asked everyone in the room, like who we had an automation session that I, I do each year. We asked everyone how they felt about automa automation. Were they under any kind of pressure? And there was almost a, a kind of you're part of the problem. You're making me automate. There was a reluctance and a kind of resistance in the audience. We could see quite clearly on their faces. And, and then one year later, it was incredible how much it had changed. We asked everyone who's under pressure from, you know, executive leadership to either automate or get out of the way. And it went from no interaction to 90 percent of hands up in, in that session. So that was kind of amazing how that flipped overnight. I think I think a lot of people maybe did resist for a while, but then it came from like sea level executive. Like, no, this is what's happening. Either automate or get out of the way. <laughs> right. So I think one of the interesting thing, too, is that we actually see is that 
you like, I think you kind of pointed this a little bit in the beginning is, hey, the knowledge might not necessarily be there. So, you know, we might not necessarily know how to code or or do things like that or write scripts. So is this kind of super net ops uh, uh, initiative kind of also teaching or helping uh, network operators, even engineers how to code? Or is it just it's saying, hey, we're going to teach you process and uh, you can kind of go figure out the rest? So the, the, that's that's actually a great question. It is a journey and it, and it does take time to kind of take these steps. I mean, in, in the same way that a, a software engineer is not going to understand BGP from 10 minutes of reading a manual, uh, also the network engineer is not immediately going to be able to create uh, a full automated system from end to end. But what we had to do was close the gap between the two. So the, the training program, which is free, on demand, online, you literally just sign up with a free account and you start learning. But we, we teach to begin with just how to do the things you've always been doing via a RESTful API. Like that step one is just how to translate the, your, your 20 years of habit, maybe you're younger than me, hasn't been 20 years, but 20 years industry culture of always using a CLI and just using a REST interface. And then we build on that and we're like how to create, not just how to use REST. I think a lot of vendors jumped in early and just went, here's my REST interface, work it out. Well. We go beyond just teaching people how to do things via REST. We teach them sustainable practices, and that's what's key. If you look at the way a developer automates versus someone who just worked out a bit of Python, um, it's really easy to code yourself into a way that then is unsustainable long term. You, you will code yourself into a really bad place and never get back out of it. So we took that on board as like a, a real threat to not, not us, to the industry. We wanted to bring these people that we've been working with with us on this journey and we've been looking at how we can help them transform. So it was about to getting off the keyboard first, off the CLI, uh, I mean, uh, but then also getting these methodologies that, that are second nature to an engineer because they've been brainwashed down that path and making sure that these people who have, have learned a REST API to, to do an implementation that won't break later just because we do a slightly different thing higher up in the system. Right. So the interesting thing too is uh, what we also notice is that um, sometimes the, the the kind of the concepts uh, and or even know what where to start is kind of a hard thing. So this is an interesting program to potentially help that. Now it sounds like you you guys did a lot of learning from some customers out there. Now are you also providing to some of these organizations who want to come and learn about this some case studies to say, hey, like this is where this organization started and this is how they became successful and uh, and and some people have kind of almost like a template to kind of follow. So we, we don't have a lot of case studies on this because we haven't tried to own it like um, like it's our thing and it's just for us and just to help our customers. In fact, the entire thing was developed on GitHub. And the, the training actually started out as a uh, instructor-led program. We had to actually go and be in the classroom and spin up a whole bunch of virtual machines and we would give a talk at the beginning and then people go through the labs and we'd help them all. But we did that very intentionally because over the first few months of delivering this super net ops training program, every time, anytime someone found an issue or they found something was a little unclear, we would teach them how to do a pull request against the training course. And before their very eyes, they would see that that would kick off a CI integration, continuous integration. I think that's number four for continuous. They would kick off an integration that would rebuild the entire training portal and they would see their change immediately. It would just happen for them. So they became a part of the process. So our list of contributors to this training program is huge. So while I don't, to your question about like case studies and references, we don't have the traditional kind of case study. But if you just look at how many people contributed, to me, that's the biggest statement in itself. The amount of people that got involved and, and made themselves a part of it as well, like that, that to me spoke volumes. Right. So the, you know, no, we have seen, you, I, you kind of brought this up, you talked about continuous integration. Now we've kind of seen an evolution in the market a little bit. We talked about, they talked about moving to agile and then continuous delivery and then continuous integration. And that's kind of started that trend. Um, and now kind of DevOps is supposed to modernize those processes. Um, if they've organizations kind of culture shift to that is, is, are you seeing that, you know, moving to DevOps, um, is been a bigger shift for organizations than just kind of moving to some of these other processes that they've come into the market and have trended through the market? I, I totally agree with that sentiment. And it's mostly because it was easier to affect change within a silo, within an operational kind of 
area. So, you know, for developers to go from one to the other, I mean, there are programs, there are training companies that will come into your organization to help you make that transition. That's all great, but it's within people who understand those concepts. So it's easier for them to grok. But as soon as you start taking people that have had no visibility of these concepts, and we take entire different teams. And um, in, in fact, a, a great way I love to explain this, what I my first car was a 1972 Ma, uh, Ford Escort Mark I. And I would change the engine. Don't ask why I was blowing engines up, but I would change the engine. I could change the gearbox. And I did this from reading a manual. It wasn't online. The manuals weren't even online back then. I went and bought a book and I made that happen. And now I open the bonnet of the car, the hood, keep forgetting I live in America now, and I have no idea what's going on. And it's probably good I don't try. That's the kind of evolution that's happened. I was in my safe, secure world, and now there's all this technology that is not from my world, and it's not from my experience. So how do I bring them closer together? So DevOps has shook, just shaken up the world for all of us because it's broken those silos within organizations that previous initiatives didn't like SDN didn't break the way a developer did something whereas DevOps did because now DevOps is reliant on me as someone who's automating the part of the network to do the right thing to make it sustainable the way that I've automated and integrated it so that when they hit commit it ends up being live and they're getting the results back of that AB testing not having to wait and be like oh so it turns out that our networking team didn't learn the principles and practices of DevOps and now we have another outage. We're, we're talking with Nathan Pierce from F5 Networks about DevOps. When we come back, we're going to bring in our panel to, bring, to also drop some knowledge on the Twilight Riot and maybe get in some questions. But first, we have to thank another sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is DigitalOcean. Now, now, as a developer, I can I tell you that experimenting with your apps and actually getting them out to a truly hosted environment is sometimes hard. Now, if it was easier to deploy to hoster services, uh, you can you can focus more on your innovation and more on developing the stuff rather than the, the logistics of it. Now, DigitalOcean removes that impedance of cloud deployments and hosting. They make it easier than ever to deploy your applications and code and store things on cloud storage without all the steps in between. Now, I love the names that they give things, starting with DigitalOcean's droplets, which are actually super scalable virtual machines that you can add storage, security, and monitoring capabilities with just one click of a button and they also have a really great one click deployment model that makes it easy to bootstrap your project now you want a specific distribution of linux go ahead and one click deploy ubuntu centos debian and more and how about just one click deploy an application or application stack well you can add docker lamp mongodb nojs mysql and more with just one click of a button now not only is it easy to deploy it's actually easy to manage as well. They have this VM snapshot capability, which makes it super simple to manage. And for me, that gives me peace of mind that that last known good state is always one click away. Plus, team management and unified collaboration helps your teams manage and scale your infrastructure and apps. One click, add a cloud firewall for your droplet or your droplet groups. Now get this, cloud firewalls are free. Now, don't let that free t tag actually fool you. These firewalls are not just for low-tier systems, just for testing environments. These are production-ready firewalls that can scale with your business. Now, to meet the demands of the market, DigitalOcean follows the great model of pay-for-play pricing. It's not only clear and concise, it helps you model out those demands of your applications and services as you grow. Want more storage? Add more block storage to meet the needs of your application. Just 10 cents per gigabyte per month worry less about adding more peace of mind to your application. Now, if you want your site has become really successful and it's starting to scale, you, you actually want to make sure your, your services scale quickly. Well, load balancers are actually highly available and fully managed services that work right out of the box. And if you're like me, you actually like to write scripts to manage those things and manage your, manage your services. Well, DigitalOcean also has you covered. They have a really great API. Um, that uses standard HTTP requests, and you can deploy and manage thousands of droplets and resources in a single programmatic way. Now, there's no reason why you shouldn't go and try DigitalOcean right now, especially to support Twi. Go to do.co slash enterprise. Even if you think you might have a project in the near future, you should go out there right now and get that credit. Now, sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash enterprise. That's do.co slash enterprise for a free 
$100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support and This Week at Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we're, we are talking with Nathan from F5 about de- DevOps, but I did want to bring in our co-hosts in crime here to kind of get their thoughts in, starting with Brian McHenry. Brian, you had some thoughts on how organizations are adopting DevOps and um, you know maybe if it's, it's being used for or not. Yeah, so Nathan, I'm going to try to go tough on you considering this is a little bit uh, F5 on F5 here. But um, what, given my passion about security, what are you seeing? Um, you, know, you said super net ops, and I'm thinking application security. How does super net ops help, help people have better application security? So super net ops is about that transformation. So I wouldn't say it's an improvement of the security posture itself, but more oriented around the delivery and how that security posture is implemented. So if we're moving to this model where it's continuous deployment, so a developer checks in some code and then it's in production through a series of automations that make up an orchestrated system, then we have to make sure that security is a part of that and not an afterthought somehow shoehorned in um, after the fact. So we're doing a lot of work. In fact, security was the last module added to the SuperNet Ops training once we'd worked out how to do all the base things um, to show people how I can pull in things like a WAF policy or a firewall rule and make that just part of the deployment and make that totally transparent to the upstream development teams. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I'll follow that up with one more pointed question at the office of the CTO. So why is a hardware company like F5 so interested in these software projects? For the record, I didn't get seated these questions before and Brian's not lowballing me today. Um, so yeah, you know what? Actually, it's it's really interesting. We are, most of our product development team is actually software engineers. Like it's in the high 80 percentile. Um, so th- that surprises a lot of people that we're, we're perceived as this hardware con- company. We're a software company that's oriented around layer seven application services that also makes hardware for those customers and workloads that demand it. So while there's a huge increase in our software only business and our direction in software, uh, our, our virtual appliances, et cetera, then at the other end, there's also people asking for more hardware, bigger hardware and faster hardware. And I think what's really changed actually is the type of people asking for those things is starting to merge. Uh, sorry, not merge, diverge. The other one. Um, so we're seeing more and more um, enterprise use cases where it used to be just straight hardware, nothing else, being a hybrid of the two, depending on the application, the architecture of the application, which is evolving and changing as well. So, yeah, different audience for each type of platform, but we're still seeing very much demand for both. Cool. Hey, thanks, Nathan. I'm going to kick it back to uh, Lou. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, now, Curtis, I'm going to bring you in. I think you had some thoughts on DevOps as well, right? You know, I, I do. I've covered DevOps a lot. And Nathan, I've got a, got a question. We talk about DevOps an awful lot from the perspective of the, the operations people who have to be taught about the continuous deployment, who have to get into the uh, whole mindset of everything is software. My real question is, how much of an adjustment have you seen the other side have to make? You know, if the those software engineers and the, and the developers in understanding what's truly required for deployment and operations. I mean, is DevOps one of these tilted to one side things where everyone has to adapt to the needs of the developers? Or do you see lots of adaptation that has to take place over on the developer side as well? That's a great question. And you're actually the first person who's asked me that. So (laughs) thank you for raising that one. Um, There's definitely some change that has to go on the development side. There are still a lot of architectures and a lot of applications out there being developed and sustained uh, that are oriented around a build that is a closed process that does not support continuous integration of any side type. And they're all oriented around everyone checks their code in. And once they've all been checked in, then they run a build and then testing happens as a series of events after the build and these are why we still have so many services and applications that are have 
release cycles that are once a month or maybe they got quicker and it's once a fortnight, but it's still nothing continuous really about it. So there's had to be a huge change in the way that people write code that makes it more modular, where I can change a service that doesn't impact the rest of the entire deployed application. And that means I can now just deploy an update to that service without having to do a full build of everything that it talks to. So that's this whole sort of microservice world and we're hearing about things being more modular and and even um, distributed services where maybe I write an application, but I'm not going to write any um, federation on it. I'm actually going to use a SaaS provider that does federation for me. So that concept never would have been used before. People would have thought that was insane. They had to write the whole thing themselves. So there's huge trends and changes going on from the application side as well, definitely. Well, I, I wanted to, to follow up on that because you mentioned the whole notion of the traditional waterfall where you, you have the build, you have the testing, you have the deployment, all of those discrete steps. Within the world of DevOps, is the testing group, the both QA and functional testing, are those folks in an endangered species or is there a role for someone who can slide in there and actually help make sure that things are going to work either just before it's deployed or concurrent with the deployment? I, I think nobody is safe from some kind of transformation when it comes towards DevOps, including people who are looking after test, because with things like continuous integration, we're kicking off the testing for code commits. Not, not builds and releases. That's the continuous integration part. Um, how would this affect the rest of the code that's already running when I just changed this small module? Whereas they had the luxury before of testing everything in a nice, neat, controlled order. So yeah, test has definitely had to evolve to, um, to work in environments where just partial parts of the system are updated and the rest is the same version as before. And then they have to automate the testing across multiple different versions and platforms. So they had to get far more dynamic uh, in the way that they can do testing. Um, we've lost this controlled build kind of test environment, which made things a lot easier for them. And Nathan, I know this is this question is probably going to be more than just a, 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 a couple minutes discussion, but I wanted to kind of throw it out there for people who are kind of looking to do it. So let's say an organization is looking to adopt DevOps. What are some of the things they need to do? Like, actually, a better question would be, what are some of the myths of, of DevOps that they should just know out of the box, hey, this is not going to solve this um, or make this better unless you put a lot of effort into it? You know, one of my favorite things to do on a slow day is just take a look on maybe LinkedIn or, or Reddit for um, someone to post a question like, what's your, your top six DevOps programming languages? Or uh, what, it, what is your favorite DevOps orchestration tool? DevOps is cultural. It's a practice. It's a way of looking at things. It's a way of um, designing end-to-end -end systems thinking and making that sustainable and adopting continuous improvement. So the the, the biggest myth, I, the same thing happened with cloud. Everyone just took what they were all doing and slapped the word cloud on there and went, hey, yeah, we're doing it too. Uh, I, I see DevOps already being used that way, which kind of is a little frustrating when it is, it's a behavior, not a product or a tool. That's going to be so my if it <laughs> Right, right, right. So if an organization wanted to get started, where, where's the, I mean, obviously, since this is a huge topic, it's a bunch of things you have to figure out, um, both on a cultural side and operations side, on a dev side, where, you know, obviously you said you're, you guys have a program, where, where else should an organization go uh, to kind of get started to understand what they need to do? I think one of the best things to start with is actually to ensure you properly evaluate whether the service that you're looking at applying it to is even suitable. There are some organizations that they have certain regulatory requirements that just prevent this. They just cannot go to continuous deployment. And yet they've tried to do that. And it, it just doesn't work. They can get as close as maybe continuous delivery, but not quite continuous deployment. A person needs to take that step because there's a ratification process that a human must, otherwise they're no longer compliant, perform for them manually. So I, I think a great place to start is actually to make sure you pick something that's um, probably new. Don't try and migrate an existing service and start out with something lightweight. I've seen some people um, learn how to adopt it within their organization, learn how to transform their culture by first just picking a service like an address book lookup.
let's let's just create something that can go in and query my address book and throw that out in a mobile app and we're going to start with that and we're going to make that be a continuous integrated and continuous deployment system because this one i mean you're not going to get upset if the address book maybe went down for 30 minutes because we accidentally learned something very important along the way that's going to make us more robust in the future i mean that's a big part of devops is continuous improvement just keep pushing forward always be working on the system not the individual deployment so i i recommend people i i we've had a lot of success like like with super netops we started with documentation. We made sure that the entire pipeline was oriented around ensuring that our documentation was fantastic. And the things we learned building that automated pipeline for documentation was huge. And we applied that then to software release. But if we'd gone straight to software release, we would have been learning those things around software that people require and are dependent on. And that would have not been very clever of us. So there, there are really easy projects, like quick wins that can get you used to those behavioral patterns that you're going to have to apply to more critical systems later. Right. I think I, I think I counted, I think we're at 43 times you said continuous, but we'll have to have our listeners go back and uh, count themselves. <laughs> I continuously well, folks, use the term. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's the term of the day. Well, folks, unfortunately, we run out of time. You've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise show according to 9 out of 10 Agile methodologies. But I wanted to thank our panelists from dropping some knowledge on the Twilight Riot, starting with one of our co-hosts in cry, Mr. Brian McHenry. Always a pleasure having you, sir. You can tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your work. Thanks, Lou. You can find me at uh, B.A. McHenry on Twitter and on devcentral.f5.com. And be on the lookout for more security learnings and see what I'm learning right along with you. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Of course, we have to thank the great Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, can you tell the folks at home where they can find you, your work, and your near journeys to all of the new conferences that are out there? Well, you can always find my writing at Dark Reading. That's darkreading.com. I'll usually put out some uh, information on that writing at Twitter. Follow me at KG4GWA. I'm doing some stuff with uh, AI right now. So if you've got any thoughts about the use of AI in security, I'd love to hear it. Drop me a direct message on Twitter. Uh, send DM to KG4GWA and look for uh, that stuff uh, online starting next week. Thanks, Curtis. Curtis, Brian, could not definitely not do the show without you guys. So thank you so much for being here. Of course, I want to thank our guest for today, Nathan Pierce from F5 Networks. Nathan, wanted to give you a chance, maybe 30 seconds to kind of go give tell people at home where they can find you, your work, a little bit about F5, and of course about the, the programs that you guys are offering. Certainly, uh, something we're starting uh, right now is actually the Office of the CTO is going to be far more public on the things we're looking at in the future. So you're going to see a lot of that on f5.com um, through the corporate blogging. But myself personally, the prototypes I'm working on that I mentioned at the very beginning, I published all of them on my redtalks.live site, redtalks.live, the RED standing for Ranting Engineers and DevOps. Um, I, I post a lot of prototype ideas out there like like my work recently with github on configuration as code automation um in fact there it is good you guys are quick um and uh yeah I, I throw a sample code up demonstration code uh just how to get weird stuff working it's kind of my fun pl playground that i uh i share things and I make little icons like that one up there. Isn't that fun? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here, Nathan. We really appreciate it. Of course, folks, we want to thank you as well. You tune in each and every week. You are our loyal listeners and our followers. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to the show each and every week. So go out right now to twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our amazing back episodes, plus all of the show notes. And of course, the guest information, our co-host information, as well as the stories we do during the show. Um, and plus, if while you're there, you might as well hit that magic button next to the show where it basically subscribes to the show. You can shoot the video of your choice, uh, whether it's audio, video, HD video. Uh, of course, the device of your choice, phone, tablet, laptop, desktop. And after you subscribe, share that show with your friends and family and coworkers as well, because we love doing this show and with your support. We can keep doing it now after you subscribe. Also, remember, we also do this show live each and every week at 1.30 Pacific time. 
And that's at live.twit.tv. So come out and see how the pizza is made and all the secrets behind the scenes. And of course, if you're going to jump in and watch the show live, you might as well jump into the chat room live as well. And that's irc.twit.tv. We get a lot of questions and we get a lot of great discussions from the chat room as well. Also, I don't want to forget, you know, make sure you don't forget, uh, go to twitter.com slash LuaMM and subscribe to all the stuff I do and uh, post about, uh, as well as all the work that I do at Microsoft. And if you want to check out some of the work I do at Microsoft, you could check out dev.office.com and see how you can extend Office to make it more productive for you uh, and your organization. Now, I also want to thank all the people that make this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa, who continue to support us each and every week doing This Week in Enterprise Tech. And also thank you to all the engineers uh, and people that help make this show possible. Um, also, especially to our tireless producer, Mr. Brian Chi, who helps find guests and set up show notes and do all of the logistics behind the scenes. So we really thank him. Uh, wow, Kevin, you are fast. You're one of the <laughs> super fast. Well, also, we want to thank Kevin, our TD today. Uh, yeah, you've done a great job. And uh, thank you for being on the show as usual. And of course, uh, we have to stick with tradition. Can you uh, maybe tell the folks at home what the uh, the show's uh, subject was today? Uh, it was about um, Superman ops or something. <laughs> <laughs> very <laughs> close, very close. We'll, we'll, we'll almost give you that one, but I think I will say, let's say just DevOps for today. But okay. uh, maybe next time uh, we'll, we'll get you there. Well, and until next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep twying.